Hey everyone, this is installment number two with the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage and as you can see I have my Circa 1906 Singer 15 treadle machine and of course I have it out of the table <clears throat> and it's sitting up here on its side and I wanted to kind of show you folks the underside of what uh, you may never pay attention to with a sewing machine. Now, the, one of the reasons you have a lot more oiling points with a vintage machine is because the vintage machines that are worth uh, uh, worth restoring, and this is just my opinion, are all steel. They're all metal. And so uh, any metal machine requires lubrication in next to the moving parts. Now up top, I'll show you guys in a little bit that there are actual oiling points for the machine up top. And that's generally where most of the oiling was, was uh, performed. But underneath you also do. And they're not marked, okay? Some of the machines later in the 50s and 60s, they might mark them. So you might say, well, how do I know where to oil? It's actually fairly simple. If you look at the underside and you move the hand wheel, what you're going to see is you'll see the parts that move against each other or slide. And so sometimes you'll see an oiling point, an oiling hole. Let's see if I can get it to show up here for you. You guys see that little hole right there? Uh, that's actually an oiling point, but, but any place where you see metal coming together, you're going to put a, the normal maintenance is going to be one drop of oil. Never put more than one drop when you're doing regular maintenance of your sewing machine, because if you put more than one drop at any spot, what you're going to get is a mess, and you're just going to have oil dripping all over your floor. And if you can see here, there are certain points, uh, and, and you can look from the side, and you can see these points right here. Um, where metal moves against metal and you just put one drop. Some places are obvious, some are not, but just keep looking and you'll find them. There's probably a good dozen spots here that I've oiled. Now when you're restoring an old machine like this one, <clears throat> it's going to take more than one drop of oil and sometimes other materials to get the machines to move. And that's because they are often bone dry. They've been sitting for years without any lubrication. and. Um, Sometimes the machines will not move as freely as this one. One of the reasons I always suggest to people, if you're new to sewing machine restoration, start with a, with a vintage Singer. It doesn't have to be a 15 class, but it's a great example of one to start with. And you're going to want to to start with a straight stitch Singer because they are some of the friendliest machines that you're ever going to work on. Uh, I've worked on many brands and I enjoy restoring all of them, but the Singers are, when you're new to, to this hobby, they are, and they're just friendly. They're a pleasure to work on normally, uh, and there are exceptions to that as well. But generally speaking, um, if you're starting out and you don't want to become too overwhelmed or get discouraged, a basic straight stitch Singer like the 15 class that I'm playing with here, whether it's a treadle or an electric, uh, they're just wonderful machines to play with. Uh, this machine was not frozen up. Sometimes when they do get frozen, you may want to look at, there are um, products, um, uh, some people will use WD-40. I'm not a fan of that, mainly because people think it's an oil lubricant and it's not. It's useful for freeing up uh, frozen things, but uh, there are products out there like Liquid Wrench, other products. Uh, I use them outside because a lot of them produce odors that uh, can be really unpleasant. I don't, I don't want to really be indoors when I'm doing that. I need, you need really good ventilation when you're using any of those things. But for the Singer, I don't even need that, right? I just needed to clean it. So before, before I hit these oiling points, I went underneath. I took my brush. Some of you may want to use canned air. You want to be careful with the canned air that you're not pushing dust and debris up in areas of the machine that doesn't want them but basically uh, I basically cleared out any of the dust and uh, lint that often builds up and as you can see right here this is on this uh, vintage class 15 you're gonna see the 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 hook for the shuttle is right here the bobbin case is here I'm gonna be pulling that out in fact I can pull it out right now and show you folks uh, how these work if I can get my giant fingers here on it there we go and you can see that the thread is actually still in there. You see the old school 15 class bobbin, beautifully machined. And one of the things I'll be doing is I'm going to be loosening these screws. And I'm going to be taking off this cover to get access. Why would I do that? Well, I want to get back there and look because there's probably going to be old lint, old uh, dust, and old oil. And when you get old sewing machine oil, and let's say you've got a machine that's been sitting in an attic for years. Very often, these old oils become gummy. They almost become like glue. And 
some of these machines were so beautifully engineered, they often work in spite of uh, those conditions. But if you want a sewing machine to perform well, I always tell my customers, look, if we're going to do this, let's do it the proper way, right? We're going to take the machine apart, we're going to clean it, we're going to bring it back to where it was when it was new. In terms of its operation, you're going to have patina, you know, the, the paint, the decals, uh, and that patina can be really nice. You don't necessarily want to, I really do not recommend repainting sewing machines. It's very costly to do properly. And you, again, this is, a, this is more of a subjective opinion piece. Uh, it has no impact on the function of the machine for sewing. And again, I would, I would save my resources for really giving it a great restoration. There are ways to make it look prettier, and we're going to certainly clean the body. Some people like to do that first. Once I get the main dust off, I leave this for last. Um, and cleaning the body of a sewing machine is actually a little more involved than you might think, and I'll, I'll cover that in a separate video segment here. But anyway, what you're looking at is the shuttle and the race, and again, this design, this basic layout, would be copied for uh, well into the 50s and 60s. I mean, this is considered one of the great designs of sewing machines. So, why are they heavy? This platform, the whole body in this case, is cast iron, right? So you have a lot of steel, cast iron, um, and I mean, you can look at the sizes of the drive shafts, right? Uh, and, and they were clearly made to, to last a really long time. And when I'm finished, this machine is going to start sewing stitches again. It's just, just incredible that a, a product that was designed for the home, it was never intended for a factory, uh, 100 years later, is still ready to work, right? I, I kind of wonder sometimes the modern sewing machines, if any of them will even exist in 100 years, and if anyone will know how to make them work. Who knows? We'll, we'll have to find out. I'm, I'm a little skeptical. But... Uh, Anyway, you'll see the uh, underneath, you're going to see the what's called the bobbin plate, um, or the shuttle plate, some people call it, and it has a little sort of a, a bracket. It's not really a bracket. It looks like a spring, but it's basically something that holds it and lets it slide, but it can also be removed if need be. And so anyway, I'll be taking this apart, and uh, you're, you'll see photographs on the Craigslist posting for where I did this, but what I want to do is... Um, Take all of this loose, get it off of there, and get it cleaned, uh, and then put it back together. I'll, uh, I'll probably start, <clears throat> since it's a little difficult to hold the camera, I'm going to take this off, and as I start to put it back together, I'll show you guys kind of the process for how it's done. Uh, a couple of other areas I'm going to be working on, excuse, excuse that, is this area. Uh, I've already taken off what's called the needle plate, right? Uh, this is where your feed dogs, which are right here, this is where they come up through the bottom of the machine. And I've already taken some of this out, but as you can see, there's an awful, awful lot of, um, of old lint built up. And this is normal. This happens over time. There's oil in here. Uh, someone has managed to get a little oil in here, but that's normal too. But you see, I'm just scraping this. It's old lint and oil. It acts like... Uh, you know, these machines are so tough, yes, you can sometimes get them to sew stitches. This is what most of this stuff looks like, guys. And it's, again, it's not that someone was... The fact that the lint got here is, is normal. It's not that they were her abusing the machine, but it just hasn't been cleaned. And you really have to take care of these things by taking them apart, cleaning them. For you, for most of you, just simply taking a lint brush is going to be all you're going to need to do to clean these, right? And occasionally you can, you can, uh, you can take the plate off. Uh, when I restore a machine, these are the screws, and I've got them in these screw uh, holes so that we don't get lint down in the holes. But when I put these back, I clean them, and even put a little drop of oil on the screws because you never know how long it has been since uh, a machine was touched by any service person, and that's why you have to be careful. As I was getting these screws loose, I was. I was sort of getting a feel for how how easy it was going to be to, to make that happen. And I was almost, they were so tight, I almost got to the point where I was going to put a little little um, degreaser on there to to basically let them, let it soak in there and, and let them get um, loosened before I did that. Because you never want to force them. Singers, uh, all the steel, even down to the screws and the, and the bobbin cases, everything that they did, 
in this wonderful era of Singer back then was top notch. I mean, the quality was incredible, even better than the, the later Japanese copies that would come in. And I know some of you may disagree, but I've noticed that some of the screws and hardware in the Japanese copies, you know, they cut corners a few places, but uh, I would not be ashamed to sew on a Japanese clone by any means. Um, in fact, I restore them, I sell them. They make very strong sewing machines. But um, I've just noticed in the years I've been doing this and tearing the machines down and getting them clean that I almost never have Singer screws snap off or break. But again, you, you want to err on the side of caution when you're dealing with something that's 100 years old. And um, you can see me going in here just looking for, um, just looking for uh, places that I, can, that I can get some of that old lint out. <clears throat> Because again, you want this machine to be able to run the way uh, the way it was designed to, and it was designed to be cleaned. And people who own the machines were told, you know, you clean your feed dogs of lint, uh, and you oil the machine regularly. And that's all you folks will have to do once you've got a machine that's restored. Uh, you're not going to have a lot of maintenance. You see me here. I'm pushing out. Sometimes you want to take a tool like this and kind of go into the feed dogs because. Depending on how tarnished they are, you may not even see this, right? I couldn't even see this old lint until I got in here with the tool and it started lifting it up. And then I'm going to take my little brush here and just kind of scrub over it. Um, and again, I'm looking for loose debris and old lint to get out of here. So this, these are all examples of what you can do. Oh, another thing I'm going to be taking a look at is the tension assembly. Now on this 1906 model there's no numbered dials but you still see the discs, you see the check spring and uh, you adjusted it here. There's a there's a compression spring here that <clears throat> that allows you to adjust the pressure. Now a lot of times you folks who are buying machines sometimes you'll buy them on the internet it'll say machine has been tuned up. Uh, when I list a machine for sale I list everything I've done to it, or the vast majority of the things I've done. And I want to do to look at this. I see tarnish. I see some some dirt. And this is the place where the thread is going to slip through, and it's going to control your tension. And those of you who are experienced sewers, you know how important thread tension is. Now, I could easily just sort of brush over this, and you know, um, some people even squirt oil in there, which is not really a good idea. Um, but you can oil this little set screw here and then they just leave it alone and it functions and the thread goes in. But I have noticed I want to take this apart. I'm going to take it all apart in a certain order because it has to go back in a certain order. And the reason I'm doing that is I want to get to these uh, tension discs. I want to take them out. I want to clean them and I might just rub a, a very light layer of oil and buff them. And because I want that thread to, to, to go through there the way it was designed to. So again, um, you know, we, we want to do this some of you may be noticing the heavy tarnish uh, on the on this beautiful side plate, this scroll uh, side plate here. And again, I will be addressing that at some point, but I'm saving that for the end, right? Some people want to get right to that part, but you really need to do the machine justice and get it ready to function again, because this is truly, uh, it's an heirloom quality uh, machine, and it, and it, it should keep sewing uh, for, for more generations. It just, again, as I've repeating myself many times, it just needs the service that it was designed to get.